Welcome to the video short course on slurry trench wall hydraulic barrier applications. This video was developed at the University of Texas at Austin and sponsored by Remedial Construction Services LP, headquartered in Houston, Texas, and Muser Rutledge Consulting Engineers, headquartered in New York, New York. What exactly is a slurry trench hydraulic barrier? In the simplest terms, a slurry trench hydraulic barrier is a trench of low hydraulic conductivity material. The construction of the wall consists of excavating a trench with its sidewalls supported by a bentonite water slurry and then backfilling the trench with a design material mixture to produce an impervious wall or barrier. The design material mixture can include soil, slurry, concrete, and or plastics depending on the nature of the project. The rest of this video is going to break down the design and construction of a slurry hydraulic barrier in more detail for the viewer to better understand the complexity of this manufactured element. For our purposes, we will be defining cutoff applications as a barrier and not a wall. There is a lot of confusion between calling the systems and applications involving slurry trenches as walls or barriers. We will in this video and follow-up videos call anything that involves cutoff or hydraulic applications as a barrier while anything involving a structural component, that is trench construction involving reinforcement or retaining purposes, as a wall. This distinction is not found universally in the world of slurry trench engineering and the viewers are advised to approach each piece of literature or media with caution when reviewing various information on the subject. The history of the slurry trench hydraulic barrier begins in the related field of slurries. Slurries were first developed and implemented in the oil and gas industry for exploration and drilling purposes at the turn of the 20th century. In 1901, a 300 meter hole was dug in soft formations off the Gulf of Mexico, and mud laden fluid from these formations was almost certainly employed through a pit. The first published work on the subject was produced in 1913. Over the next 20 years, the construction procedures and uses of slurry spread to various industries, including excavation supports, foundation design, pier construction, and eventually to cut off barrier design. In the 1930s, Christian Vetter in Milan, Italy, developed the continuous diaphragm wall using the slurry supported trench. This concept was an evolution from the mud filled borehole and the continuous board pile wall previously in use. In the United States, the first slurry trench hydraulic barrier was constructed in the late 1940s at the Terminal Island Project near Long Beach, California. This particular trench was constructed to prevent salt water from penetrating the freshwater zone during a construction project along the ocean front. The project included a 45 foot deep cutoff wall trench protected by a water bentonite slurry that was eventually backfilled with soil. Today, slurry trench hydraulic barriers are becoming a common practice for several areas of civil engineering including dam construction, the mining industry, water control structures like levees, and the environmental industry. The main reasons for the increased use of slurry hydraulic barriers in recent decades is associated with their relatively low costs, ease of construction, flexibility, usefulness in relatively unstable or mobile material, continuous trench construction, which includes no cold joints, and the fact that they can be constructed without significant disturbance to the natural groundwater flow regime. Now we will briefly review several of the alternative applications associated with hydraulic barriers. The first discussed application is containment and capping. The illustration shows a proposed landfill site. The colored lines around cell 1 are the alternative alignments for a proposed hydraulic barrier. Containment and capping involves capturing waste within a hydraulic barrier and preventing groundwater from percolating and transporting the waste, as seen in this illustration. The contamination can then be treated by various methods, and the groundwater level inside the containment can be controlled for stability and transport purposes. Environmental engineering and remediation and the oil and gas industries are several areas associated with this particular application. The next application is collection and remediation. In collection and remediation, groundwater is allowed to percolate through a contaminant plume and the hydraulic barrier acts as a catchment. The waste leachate is then collected and pumped out by extraction wells where it can be treated at the ground surface. 
In certain situations, the treated groundwater may be reintroduced into the contaminant plume, and the process continued over and over until sufficient contaminant is removed. This application is particular to the environmental industry. The third discussed application is seepage control. In front of you is the schematic of the application in place at the Lackahatchee Reservoir in Florida. In this particular application, the hydraulic barrier is controlling the flow of water from one area to another. The method is necessary due to differential gradients on either side of the wall. This method is particularly useful for controlling water levels in ponds, lakes, and reservoirs, where collecting the water for future use is the main objective. The next discussed application is cutoffs under or through structures. The picture in front of you shows the application being used in the enhancement or improvement of an existing levee. The application can also be used in new levee construction. In this particular method, the hydraulic barrier prevents seepage as well as controls the hydraulic head on either side of the structure, whether that structure is a dam, dike, levee, or coffer dam. The barrier also increases the length of the flow path under the structure. The hydraulic barrier provides one of the vital elements associated with the stability of the structure and prevents piping within the structure, which could lead to the failure if not controlled. This application can be used by the Army Corps of Engineers, municipalities, counties, states, and the mining industry for various purposes. The fifth discussed application is dewatering. Dewatering applications isolate an area where the water is lowered in order to construct a dry working zone and or a permanent zone that is dry for various purposes. This case is similar to the last mentioned because the hydraulic head is being controlled by the combination of the barrier wall and extraction wells. The application can be used for temporary construction purposes to provide safe working environments or permanent applications where a high water table must be controlled. This particular illustration was provided by the Army Corps of Engineers. And lastly, here is a list of some of the other uses a slurry trench hydraulic barrier has been used for in today's industries. We will now discuss the properties and history of slurry because of its role in the construction of a hydraulic barrier. As the name implies, the slurry trench hydraulic barrier has a key and defining material element, slurry. Slurry provides the support for stability of the trench walls during construction and the inhibiting material for accomplishing the design hydraulic permeability. This controlling element is simply a clay colloidal system, basically a small amount of rock powder, typically bentonite, stirred into a large volume of water. Bentonite is a soft, soapy feeling rock that primarily consists of a clay mineral, not merlinite, of smectite. The bentonite performs two functions during the construction of a hydraulic barrier. Number one, creating a filter cake on the walls of the trench, and number two, maintaining a certain density through suspension of soil particles in the slurry to prevent collapse of the trench walls. It is important to remember that bentonite is not the only clay particle used in slurries. Many other clay particles can also be used, including adipolgite and kaolinite, depending on what is needed in the project. For the first function, the filter cake provides a low permeable surface that retains the slurry within the trench and provides a relatively uniform surface for the slurry to apply lateral pressure on the trench walls that resist the forces along the failure surface of the soil. For the second function, the density of the bentonite slurry is important because it holds particles in suspension that can apply a greater force of resistance against the forces of the soil. The standard used by the industry in the United States for slurries is the American Petroleum Institute's, or API, Guide for Slurries, 13A. Slurry was first introduced and used as a design element to remove material using the intensive material property of differential density between water and a liquid with clay suspension. M. Favelle, a French engineer, is often credited with the first use of a circulating fluid to remove cuttings. In 1895, he used water to carry away cuttings while drilling a 170 meter deep well in 22 days with hollow rod tools. From this simple beginning in 1895 to the present day, slurry use has evolved immensely. Slurry is now used for a variety of applications that include oil and natural gas extraction, water well drilling, 
environmental applications, mining, and pipeline transportation, to name a few. The video will now discuss and illustrate the construction of a slurry trench hydraulic barrier. Trench construction for a slurry trench hydraulic barrier implements the continuous trench construction method. For this method, the trench is excavated and then backfilled in a continuous fashion along the center line of the wall geometry. This method allows for continuous work with no overlapping and no retracing of the job site. As can be seen in the illustration, the key components of the continuous trench method are the slurry trench, the excavated soil backfill mixing area, and the backfill. As the excavator removes soil and creates the trench, the soil is stockpiled near the trench. While excavation is occurring, other operators use equipment, usually a backhoe and bulldozer, to mix slurry with the removed soil. Off-site soil can also be used as well if needed. This mixture is then allowed to rest for a designed wait period and then reintroduced to the trench using a controlled sliding method down the design slope in the trench. The next eight slides provide video and pictures of this construction process to provide a better understanding of what has just been described. In this video, you are observing operations on a slurry filled trench. An excavator at the far end is starting the trench excavation while the clamshell cranes are extending the depth of the trench farther than was possible by the excavator. Typically, the extended excavator can go to a depth of about 65 feet while the clamshell cranes can go beyond a 65-foot depth. These are pictures of the slurry mixing plant and the slurry storage ponds. The slurry is mixed in a typical grout plant or in a shear mixer and then pumped into the slurry ponds. The slurry will stay in the slurry ponds for typically 24 hours or longer per specifications before being used in the slurry trench. This wait period allows the slurry to become fully hydrated. Hydration is important for the slurry to maintain its design properties and for proper development of the filter cake along the trench walls. This video illustrates the mixing of bentonite with water. The process can be performed using a large mix plant as seen on the previous slide, or a shear mixer as seen on this video, or other methods that provide a thorough mixing of the bentonite particles into the water. In this video, you can see the bag of bentonite sitting on top of a protective hood while the worker works inside the hood to untie the bag so that the bentonite can flow down the funnel into the water. Once this process has been completed, the worker will turn on the water and the bentonite will mix with the water and then be sent into the slurry pond where it will be hydrated for more than 24 hours.
This slide shows introduction of slurry into the trench. It is hard to see, but the hose that runs along the left side of the left picture is running down to the corner of the excavated trench, and the hose end is placed under the slurry line, where the slurry is pumped into the trench. The hose extends back to the slurry ponds located at the grout plant, which was illustrated in the previous slide, and you can also see it in the picture on the right. This video is showing backfill being mixed by two excavators that move the soil and the slurry, which is brought from the trench, around until sufficiently mixed to create the backfill with the proper characteristics specified. The backfill is tested for these characteristics before being placed in the trench. This work can also be done by a bulldozer. These pictures illustrate backfill placement. Backfill placement involves sliding the mass of backfill into the trench so that it can slog down on an incline into the trench. Backfill should not be placed by vertical dropping because this method would lead to trapped air and large voids within the barrier that could lead to channels of transport through the barrier. The slogging method, though having some negative aspects, has been shown to be the most effective method in placing the backfill while minimizing the introduction of air and the development of transport channels through the barrier. On the next slide, you will see a bulldozer placing the backfill into the trench. Notice how the operator does not push the backfill directly down the incline in the trench. Instead, the operator allows the slurry to flow down on its own on the incline slope. This final video shows the capping of the slurry trench. On the left side you can see the trench with staining water over the backfill. And in the background an excavator and bulldozer construct the levee type cap structure over the trench. The cap provides protection from the elements to prevent desiccation, animal and plant growth in the wall, and added weight to accelerate the consolidation of the backfill, further decreasing the hydraulic conductivity or permeability of the barrier. Now that we have a good understanding of the construction of a slurry hydraulic barrier, the video will go into the analysis and design of such a barrier, starting with the site investigation. The site investigation involves two studies. The first study is the feasibility study. It includes, but is not limited to, the list of items in front of you. We perform this study in order to determine if the construction of a hydraulic barrier is possible at a particular site and whether or not the hydraulic barrier is the best solution for the particular problem on site. I'll now give you a moment to look over the list. The second investigation is the design phase investigation. Once a hydraulic barrier has been decided to be constructed, this second investigation is performed to provide the designers the necessary information needed to perform a proper design. Take a moment to look over this list.
A question that comes up a lot during the design phase investigation is how many borings should be taken and at what spacing. Some clients may require a certain boring spacing to reduce risk of performance and construction claims. The primary purposes of the boring schedule and layout are number one, to determine the location of the low permeability closure key stratum, number two, to determine the minimum thickness of this stratum, and number three, to demonstrate that the stratum extends over the entire site. This slide shows a rule of thumb for designers. Once a good site investigation has been performed, the next step is performing the design of the hydraulic barrier. The next section of slides will run through considerations a designer must know and consider in order to create a good design. It should be understood that this section is only a review and not an in-depth course on the subject. An expertise beyond this video will be needed to perform a competent design, and each site will have site-specific considerations that cannot be covered in a review video. With that in mind, let's review some important design considerations. When designing a hydraulic barrier, the wall geometry is very important. The alignment must be such that the hydraulic barrier performs the desired function while staying within the confines of the owner's property. The depth of the hydraulic barrier must be such that the barrier prevents flow in the desired manner, whether that be for the containment of a particular liquid or control of water, whatever the case may be. And the thickness of the wall must be designed within the limitations of available construction equipment while also being thick enough to create the desired barrier. The grading of the site must be considered for a hydraulic barrier. In dams and levees, large head differences and subsequent gradings can form that can compromise the barrier. Another grading issue involves a phenomenon called inward gradient. This method creates a gradient such that the fluids of the system flow inward towards the center of the property, away from the barriers, which create a barrier perimeter. The result of differential pore pressures, whatever the case may be, and a large hydraulic gradient can be hydraulic fracturing. As just stated, hydraulic fracturing, or cracks, form through the slurry wall, providing pass for increased permeability as well as instability and weakening of strength of the slurry wall. This is a major concern that must be dealt with in the design of a hydraulic barrier. Several other concerns for the stability of the trench are listed here. Take a moment to familiarize yourself with them. Provided is an illustration of the stability analysis for a slurry trench. The illustration shows the acting soil pressure and resisting slurry pressure along with a water table, slurry elevation, and a surcharge within the confines of a wedge analysis. At the top is the general equation for the factor of safety of the trench. Building on the previous slide, this slide provides a few values to the elements of the stability analysis. The values are provided simply to give the viewer a rough understanding of the type of setup involved. The general equation of factor of safety has been extended to include the elements now. Several slides that follow use the above values as constants when one variable is adjusted to illustrate how adjustment of the element affects the factor of safety for the trench. In this slide, we adjusted the unit weight of slurry. Despite doubling the unit weight of the slurry, the factor of safety only adjusted from 0.75 to 1.25. In this slide, we adjusted the unit weight of the soil while maintaining a unit weight of the slurry of 70 pounds per cubic foot a value higher than the 65 pounds per cubic foot recommended by many papers on the subject of slurry trench hydraulic barriers. The significance of this slide is to illustrate that the design of slurry is site-specific. This plot shows the adjustment of cohesion of the soil with the unit weight of slurry being 70 pounds per cubic foot, the unit weight of the soil being 120 pounds per cubic foot, 
and the friction angle being 30 degrees. From the equations provided, one can see that cohesion is part of the development of the active earth pressure coefficient, K sub A. By increasing cohesion, the value of K sub A decreases. In decreasing K sub A, you decrease the value of the denominator in the factor of safety equation, thus increasing the factor of safety. One must be careful when deciding on cohesion because of the fact that it will increase factor of safety when increased, and it can be quite variable across sites in some situations. This last plot shows adjusting of the friction angle given a slurry of 70 pounds per cubic foot, soil of 120 pounds per cubic foot, and cohesion at 500 pounds per square foot. The friction angle had the most significant impact on the change in factor of safety from below 0 0.6 with no friction angle to over 1 with friction angle above 33 degrees. The friction angle, like cohesion, is part of the development of the active earth pressure coefficient K sub A and just as with cohesion, increasing the friction angle increased the factor of safety, but at a higher rate. Therefore, caution must be taken in selecting the proper friction angle for the site for the design calculations. Along the lines of stability, one must consider ground deformations in and around the trench. Ground deformations are a fact of life when working with the slurry trench construction technique. Anytime you remove soil to provide access to depths below the ground surface, you risk the soil shifting to fill the void. This illustration, provided by O'Donnell, shows what the previous slide was portraying. The trench is not a permanent structure with constant shape. It can and will deform due to the removal of soil and consolidation of the backfill. This must be kept in mind to prevent damage of existing structures and provide adequate safety during construction. A case history of such movements occurred at the Raytheon Company site in Mountain View, California, documented by Filtz, etc., 1999, and Baxter, 2000, from Virginia Tech University. In this case, deformations due to the construction of a 98-foot deep hydraulic barrier caused cracking to a building that was located 20 feet from the trench. The vertical movements were measured up to 10 centimeters and lateral movements up to 6 centimeters. The result was the total loss of production in the building and a subsequent lawsuit. At the time of design, it is believed that established and verified methods for numerical modeling of all phases of construction and consolidation were not available. Recently, the work of Baxter 2000 attempted to provide this information. The next section will cover slurry-soil interaction. This subject can lead to stability or instability for a slurry trench hydraulic barrier depending on the designer's understanding of this interaction. The following slides will cover the important topics of concern for this subject. The filter cake is a thin glue-like membrane composed of closely packed bentonite particles that fills the voids along the walls of the trench. The typical thickness of this layer is 3 mm, but varies depending on the properties of the slurry and the voids of the soil. The plot illustrates the relationship of fluid loss with the initial filter cake formation. The filter cake is important because, number one, it provides a relatively impermeable surface for the slurry to apply the resisting forces needed to maintain stability of the trench walls. Number two, prevents excess slurry loss during construction, and number three, further stabilization, creating a thin plaster-like surface along the trench walls. The filter cake develops quickly upon the start of construction of the slurry trench, and the filter cake is relatively thin if designed correctly. Research has shown that a thick filter cake will be more permeable than a thin filter cake. A concern for the slurry is resistance to flocculation in order to develop a good filter cake. In comparing the two most used bentonites, sodium bentonite resists flocculation much better than calcium bentonites when used in slurries because of the higher swell characteristics. But the prevalence of calcium in the environment leads to replacement of the sodium with calcium in the bentonite with time during construction. The previous slide hinted at the issue of water and soil chemistry and the behavior of the slurry and the development of the filter cake with the replacement of sodium by calcium within the bentonite structure. Like this example, the properties of the slurry and the filter cake can be affected by what is introduced to the slurry from the groundwater, 
whether it be natural or contaminants on the site. On this slide, you can see two simple examples to further illustrate the point. In each of the photos, a clay, sodium montmorillonite on the left, and adipolgite on the right are introduced to tap water and salt water. The beaker on the left in each photo is tap water for reference. As you can see, the sodium montmorillonite is greatly affected by the tap water and swells. At the same time, salt water makes it shrink slightly. For adipolgite, it appears that both samples were not greatly affected, swelling slightly in both tap and salt water. The unit weight of the slurry is a key part of creating a stable resisting force against the driving soil pressure into the trench. A first thought would be to add more bentonite to thicken the slurry to obtain more stability, but just adding more bentonite does not provide significant change in the unit weight of the slurry, as seen in this plot. The plot shows a typical acceptable range for percent bentonite for hydraulic barriers, that being 4 to 10 percent. This work was performed by the narrator at the recon labs by simply mixing different percentages of bentonite with water to record changes on the unit weight. To have a significant change in the slurry unit weight, one must add more types of material other than bentonite, like sand, other clay materials like kaolinite and adipolgite, and chemicals and polymers. The important properties for mountain merlinite, the chief element of bentonite, are the swelling behavior, dispersion, and thixotropy. The swelling behavior is caused by water penetrating the clay particles as well as being attracted to the negatively charged clay mineral surface. The penetration of the water into the clay particle causes it to expand. The adsorption of cations on the clay particle further expands the area between clay particles by holding onto water within what is referred to as the diffused double layer, DDL or electrical double layer, EDL. This double layer is actually two layers of charged particles, the first layer being the charged surface of the clay, and the second layer being the charged ions that are attracted to the charged surface. The clay particle will grow in size up to 10 to 12 times its original volume due to this swelling. Dispersion of the clay particles is caused by the clay surface being negatively charged. This causes clay particles near one another to repel away from each other. The repulsion leads to more water being held and further expansion of the clay. Thixotropy is the characteristic of clay in suspension to change from a viscous solution to a gel when not disturbed. The gel structure is what keeps the particles in suspension, which is important in maintaining the density of the slurry and resist the forces of the soil. The transition from gel to viscous solution will continue over and over as the slurry is agitated and allowed to set. This slide provides an illustration of a threshold for slurry viscosity in relation to the development of the filter cake along the slurry trench wall. Remember that the importance of the formation of the filter cake cannot be understated. Most failures involving slurry walls are caused by the filter cake not being developed. Now, as can be seen on the plot, as the viscosity goes below 40 marsh seconds, the time it takes for filter cake development changes exponentially. This is where the typical recommended minimum for slurry viscosity of 40 seconds was born. But specifications for a wall cannot just take this number as a guarantee of success. Slurry wall construction is site specific and must be evaluated in order to ensure the viscosity is high enough to assist in stabilization of the sidewalls of the trench while being low enough to not hinder construction of the trench. This slide illustrates how bentonite batches can greatly vary and must be evaluated. The first plot shows a single batch of bentonite from Wyoming mixed at different percent bentonite and 40 marsh seconds marked for reference. Notice the sudden change in the viscosity when it reaches 4% bentonite. This second plot is a comparison of two batches of bentonite from the same manufacturer. This plot shows that batch 1 only needed 4% bentonite by volume to reach a viscosity of 40 marsh seconds, while batch 2 needs 6% bentonite by volume to reach 40 marsh seconds. Also notice for batch 2 that the increase in viscosity is more gradual than batch 1. The purpose of this slide is to show that bentonite is a natural material that will vary in behavior and properties, even when taken from the same source and provided by the same manufacturer. 
The previous slides were discussing the slurry in the trench during construction. Now we will discuss the backfill used to refill the trench using slurry and excavated soil. A well-constructed soil bentonite wall can have a hydraulic conductivity as high as 10 to the minus 8, but should be considered in the range of 10 to the minus 7 until verified with field testing. A well-constructed cement bentonite wall can have a hydraulic conductivity as high as 10 to the minus 6, but could be as low as 10 to the minus 5. Plastic concrete and concrete diaphragm walls should be considered similar to the cement bentonite wall. Backfills can also be treated with many additives, fillers, and other products in order for the wall to perform with certain characteristics. The slurry trench hydraulic barrier includes these considerations. The backfill must have a minimum hydraulic conductivity to function as desired. The hydraulic conductivity is a major concern in the functionality of the hydraulic barrier backfill. The backfill trench must have the right characteristics to withstand the challenging conditions of the natural environment, including durability, strength, compressibility, and density. The backfill must have fluid properties during installation in order to flow into the trench in a uniform manner that fills the trench completely and maintains design properties throughout the entire trench. The adsorption capacity of the trench must be such that the barrier functions as desired. Finally, the chemical compatibility, as mentioned before, is important to not be adversely affected by the natural and other chemical elements on the site. In the plot on the left, Barvenick showed the critical value of percent of dry bentonite added to soil for backfill appeared to be 3.5% in relation to hydraulic conductivity obtained. He was performing this test in conjunction with a specific job site that he was involved with. The test shows how, in the lab, a critical value of percent betonite appears to occur at 3.5%, where the hydraulic conductivity increases exponentially below 3.5%. But it must be remembered that each site is different. Ryan demonstrated this exact point in his plot on the right. He stated that each backfill mixture must be individually tailored and a specific K cannot be assured with a chosen percent of betonite. You can easily see this with all the scatter on the plot. There has been considerable research into how the fines fraction affects hydraulic conductivity of backfill mixtures. Depolonia showed that fines fraction of a soil influences the K of soil that night. Ryan showed there is no possibility of assuring a specific K by simply choosing a specific fines content. But Evans demonstrated that 20% fines content was the critical value for K through his research. So taking into account the research presented, fines content does affect the K value and appears that 20% does provide a critical value to use as a ballpark rule of thumb start for design. As with many of the properties already discussed, each site is different and the backfill mixture must be designed with fines content considered on a site by site basis. Over the lifetime of the hydraulic barrier, unless artificially controlled, the water table around the wall will not remain at the same elevation. Cooley, 1991, showed higher K for those samples above the water table than those below the water table. The studies show that the irreversible increases in K may occur if soil bentonite is not kept continuously saturated. Several researchers have discovered that hydraulic conductivity of vertical barrier materials decreases as the effective consolidating pressure increases, leading to varying hydraulic K values along the depth of a trench. The theory of arching for a slurry trench hydraulic barrier comes from the idea that trench walls are rigid and backfill is compressible relative to one another. Deformation of the backfill leads to dipping, like a meniscus. This creates vertical shear stresses at the trench walls and reduced shear stresses in the backfill. The theory of arching in soils was started by Janssen in 1895 and was further worked on by Marson and Anderson in 1913, Trezaghi in 1945, Blight in 1973, and Handy in 1985. Evans, in 1995, applied these theories to soil bentonite trenches. The theory is dominant for shallow, wide trenches. 
The theory behind this plot is that stress increases with depth at a rate less than usual hydrostatic rate increases within a slurry wall. This illustrates further the idea of arching and how it can affect the consolidation and stress conditions within a slurry wall. Instrumentation measurements of both total and effective stresses of a slurry wall are currently hard to find in the literature. Now we will briefly cover some factors affecting the cost of a hydraulic barrier and some rule of thumb values for these costs. Here are some factors affecting the construction costs of a slurry trench hydraulic barrier. Please take a moment to read over the list. Here is a list of rule of thumb costs for construction of a slurry trench hydraulic barrier. For an example, mobilization to a job site within the state where the company's construction equipment is stored will be drastically different compared to mobilizing to a potash mine in Canada from Texas. For a work platform, the soil of the site will affect this cost. If the site is a wetland or swamp, soil stabilization for a work platform will be required and increase the cost and the cost of materials for different backfill mixtures will also increase cost to a barrier system. A final point is to make sure to compare both the unit cost and the production rate cost for each design. Test methods and compatibility. Here is a list of currently used test methods for quality control of the slurry, general clay behavior, backfill, and other tests that may be used in the design of slurry trench hydraulic barriers. Where applicable, an ASTM standard number was provided. Further information on these tests can be found in Bowders, 1986, Daniel, 1984, Dunn and Mitchell, 1984, and Olson and Daniel, 1981. The video will now turn its focus to monitoring of slurry trench hydraulic barriers. Quality control and quality assurance are both key aspects to the successful design and construction of a slurry trench hydraulic barrier. The construction of a slurry trench hydraulic barrier must be monitored to assure a successful barrier at your project site. Provided is a list of items that should be monitored regularly, including the viscosity of the slurry, slump and density of the backfill, and dimensions of the wall, including alignment and depth. Each project will require a monitoring program catered to the specific conditions of the job site. The performance of a slurry trench hydraulic barrier can be affected by conditions that may occur during construction. For example, if the wall is not excavated to the proper depth, the barrier may not key into an impermeable layer, leaving an area of highly permeable soil through the barrier. Or if the backfill is not mixed to the proper slump or density, proper fines content is not reached, or the backfill not allowed to fully saturate, the backfill may not perform as designed and desired. If the backfill is not allowed to slog down in an incline under its own weight and instead drop directly into the trench, the result can be trapped slurry, leading to higher permeable zones through the barrier. And if construction is stopped and the bentonite is allowed to settle within the slurry trench, the result can be a reduced resisting force from the slurry against the soil wedge and failure of soil off the trench walls into the trench, which will have a higher permeability than the backfill if not cleared out of the trench. This is called spalling, and it can also occur if construction doesn't stop and be a result of the various conditions that happen during construction. So remember to keep these issues in mind when developing and implementing the performance monitoring program. The performance of the hydraulic barrier must also be monitored after construction to assure that the barrier is not affected by varying conditions the barrier will experience with time. These conditions include freezing and thawing that can lead to ice lenses and wetting and drying. 
freeze thaw and wet drying can both lead to desiccation in areas of higher permeability through the barrier. Also, hydraulic fracturing through the barrier can be caused by differential head pressures along the barrier, settling or consolidation of the backfill, and drawdown of the groundwater around the barrier, either due to pumping or actions performed by a dam or lock. Finally, issues regarding the chemistry of the soil at the site and groundwater, whether already at the site or introduced later, can cause the barrier to not perform as desired, as in a higher permeability and or lower strength properties because of how it reacts with the material within the barrier. Monitoring assures that introduction of new chemistry conditions are caught and dealt with properly. In review, performance monitoring provides a basis for continued use of the slurry trench construction method, both for a particular site and for further use in the future. This includes valuable data that can help in designing and constructing better barrier systems. It provides early warning for problems and discovery for when and where to implement corrective repairs to the barrier if needed. And finally, monitoring reduces costs, both in the construction of hydraulic barriers and in remedial activities when needed. Instrumentation is used to measure deformations, load stresses and strains, and hydraulic performance of the barrier. Remember to not over-monitor the site and that what is being monitored is important to the project. Also, always develop a good plan for monitoring that has a purpose before ordering equipment and installing them on site. Within this plan, have thresholds for the various properties being measured and have alternatives and actions in place for if and when these thresholds are reached. And lastly, remember that just because values are different than calculated, that does not mean drastic changes and measures are needed automatically. Here is a list of available equipment for deformation monitoring. When looking over the list, consider the thought of what could happen if you did not monitor the deformations. How could the hydraulic barrier affect adjacent structures, like the example at the Raytheon plant in California? If the barrier is monitored and issues arise, the contractor in design can be alerted to these issues and make adjustments to the design to minimize further deformations and evaluate and attack the new conditions accordingly. Strain gauges and load cells are used for similar purposes to the deformation monitoring just discussed. No further details are provided. The hydraulic performance may be considered the most important aspect of a hydraulic barrier. Monitoring leads to an understanding of how well the barrier is performing and indicates issues with the barrier if they arise. It must be understood how this equipment works together in order to provide the best monitoring system possible. An example of this issue comes from a project in Arkansas. For some brief background, present day practice will have piezometers paired together on either side of a barrier at the same frequency to allow for monitoring across a barrier effectively. In this case, the monitoring program designer sprinkled piezometers independently of each other inside and outside the barrier instead. He then created separate contours for inside and outside the barriers, which resulted in false reading of success for the barrier. When another designer ran a subsequent monitoring program on a section of the barrier using paired piezometers, the result was finding that the groundwater flow was not actually being affected by the barrier at all. The ineffectiveness of the barrier would never have been seen by the first monitoring system and the barrier would not have been corrected to perform as desired had it not been for the second designer and his understanding of how the equipment worked together. The last topic that will be covered is specifications. It is important that a good specification is developed for a slurry trench hydraulic barrier in order to provide clear thresholds and guidance for proper construction which leads to completion of a successful barrier. Listed on this slide, there are several general specifications for templates, but it must be remembered that there is not a cookie cutter document for specifications. Directly from Ryan and Day, 1993, quote, there are many specification provisions that can have severe consequences on the constructability and cost of hydraulic barriers, end quote. 
With this in mind, it must be remembered that each project needs a catered document specifically developed around its unique characteristics and design. This concludes our video on slurry trench hydraulic barriers. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that you find the video and its content beneficial. Once again, we would like to acknowledge Remedial Construction Services LP headquartered in Houston, Texas and Muser Rutledge Consulting Engineers headquartered in New York, New York for sponsoring this work.